So, um, so there's some questions about oxidizing, reducing agents, and you know how they affect the reaction. The thing about oxidizing agents and reducing agents is they're still just reactants. They're just a specific subset of reactants that have these these other labels of oxidizing agent or reducing agent, um, but they still work the same exact way. So you still you're just because it's an oxidizing agent doesn't mean that it doesn't play a role in in limiting reactant and things like that. So um, I just want you to be aware of that vocabulary, that term oxidizing agent, reducing agent. But beyond that, treat them just like any other reaction. Um, and then somebody had a question the quiz had um, from last weekend had phosphate in it. And that was kind of a tricky one, especially because we haven't done a whole lot with acid base reactions yet. Um, that's what today's lecture is about, is talking more about acid base reactions. So hopefully that that question on the, what's it? I think it was calcium. Yeah, so calcium phosphate aqueous plus phosphoric acid. Reacts to form calcium hydrogen phosphate or is that, I think it was dihydrogen phosphate. I don't remember which. Um, it doesn't really matter. And so this is not a balanced reaction, but that doesn't start determining the reaction type. Um, this one is not entirely obvious whether it's a redox reaction or not, but we still have phosphates before and after, right? So nothing involved with the phosphate really changed oxidation state. We don't even have to really look at the oxidates. Um, uh, polyatomic ions, if it's the same polyatomic ion before and after, then it's still the same oxidation state on the phosphorus and on the oxygen. And same with the calcium. The only thing that to really consider is, well, we do have these H3, these H pluses, but there's still H pluses on over here as well. Um, and also when it comes to the oxidation states, remember that you can do the oxidation states of a polyatomic ion, of just the ion itself. We can kind of ignore the calcium to just look at the oxidation state of phosphate. Calcium is a plus two because calcium, when it's an ion, is always a plus two. So we can just look at phosphate individually, and then we can do our regular, what's the charge on an oxygen usually? Minus two. And on phosphate, there are four of them. So four times minus two is minus eight. We need the total charge to add up to three minus. So phosphor, phosphorus in this case would be plus five. All right, so just because it's a polyatomic ion, not a whole lot changes about the oxidation states. It's just, we're not trying to make it add up to zero. We're trying to make it add up to whatever the charge of that polyatomic is. Scott? What's the point that this So that is a clue. It's not a dead giveaway because phosphoric acid, just because it starts with an acid and we don't have an acid over here, it means that there's a proton transfer that happened. It means that that acid base reaction played a role in it. It might not be a, that might not be the only thing that's happening right, sometimes. Um, Yeah, because we started with an acid and we don't have an acid anymore, but we still have phosphate. So what must have happened, the phosphoric acid must have given up an H+. But again, today's whole lecture is on acid-base reactions, so we'll get a lot more practice looking at these and kind of understanding what's going on with some of these. Um, this was kind of a tricky one. Um, I was just kind of looking for you to use process of elimination for the most part. Like, okay, well, it's definitely not redox because the oxidation states didn't change. Therefore, it's, e it's a complexation. And so I could, you know, we can look at it and say, well, it's definitely not um, as a precipitation reaction. Is it an acid base reaction? That's kind of where I expected you to kind of waffle a little bit because it looks a little bit different than acid base reactions we've seen, but it is in fact an acid base reaction.
All right, let's do some more stoichiometry practice. Let's get stoichiometry to the point where in the testing situation, you can't possibly mess it up. Um, I want stoichiometry to be something you are not at all worried about by the time we get to the final, right? You should be doing it in your sleep. Um, there's a, I always heard it attributed to the football player, Chad Ochocinco, but apparently it's an older quote. You don't practice till you get something right. You practice till you can't get it wrong. So that's what we're going to do with stoichiometry. We'll start with another stoichiometry problem here. Um, some practice with some concentrations and um, we're making a solid, it's a precipitation reaction. So calcium or potassium chloride plus barium nitrate makes barium chloride and, and potassium nitrate. Calculate the limiting reactant, calculate theoretical yield, calculate percent yield. So I'll give everybody a couple minutes to try to uh, work on that one. Anything, anybody notice anything similar or anything familiar about this reaction compared to yesterday's lab? Did we use any of these chemicals in yesterday's lab? We used the barium chloride, right? Except we didn't have it barium chloride showing up as a solid, did we? That seems a little bit odd that we have it forming a precipitate here, but it didn't when we did it in lab yesterday. Any guesses as to why that would be the case? Why didn't, why did the barium chloride dissolve yesterday? What did you have to, to do to make the solution with the barium chloride? We added a whole bunch of acid, right? Basically by adding a whole bunch of acid, by acidifying the solution that make so that the barium chloride dissolved better. It didn't precipitate out. Barium sulfate would still precipitate out, but the barium chloride wouldn't, um, which is why under certain circumstances, you can get a precipitation reaction happening, um, but then you can take that same thing and, and get it to um, dissolve again if you change the, the conditions. Yeah. Side note, but there's actually a, a reaction that my Gen Chem students are doing their um, their research projects as well, just like the Science Expo here. They get to do a, a research project where they pick, you know, propose a, pro a topic and then have to go out and try and do some of the the actual science. Um, and this was this year, but a few years ago, I had a student, a couple students who want, went out in, on a hike and collected a mineral called cinnabar. Um, which is mercury two sulfide, um, and they their whole idea is they wanted to go out and collect a mineral sample and then reduce the mercury um, to turn it back into metallic mercury. So they want to take a red mineral and turn it into metallic mercury. Um, and the first step for that process was taking mercury sulfide and getting it to dissolve into mercury two plus aqueous and sulfide aqueous, which doesn't happen really easily. We had, had to use a, a mixture of strong acids called aqua regia, which is basically one of the few substances known to man that'll actually dissolve metallic gold as well. Um, but we were able to do that and they actually did produce some metallic mercury for, for their project. So that was kind of fun. But just as a um, 
as a side note that even stuff that is really, really insoluble, if you change the pH enough or if you change the conditions enough, you can still get it to dissolve sometimes. All right, back to this problem. Do we have to do any balancing? What do we need to do? Well, we've got two chlorides over here, but only one over here. So we know we've got to do a, put a two there. And if we have two potassiums now, we need two potassiums on this side. But I think that'll take care of it, right? So let's finish writing this out. 25 mils of 1.20 molar KCl. Did we, these numbers are familiar. Did we do this problem the other day? Nobody's raising their hand, so I'm gonna go with we did not. If we did, nobody paid enough attention to it. So we did, same numbers. Okay, let's change the numbers then. Um, let's see. Let's do 50 milliliters at, 0 0.15 molar, and we'll do 50 milliliters, 50.0 milliliters at, I take it back, 45 milliliters at 0 0.10. Yeah, molar. And we'll leave the 2.45 grams of barium chloride as is. All right, so what are our steps to figure out if it's a, um, what the limiting reactant is? Put everything in moles, right? So 50 milliliters, for every 1,000 milliliters of the first solution, that's 0 0.15 moles. And then for the second solution, it's 45 milliliters. And for every 1,000 milliliters, that's 0 0.10 moles. So that should come out to 4.5 times 10 to the minus four, three, 10 to the minus three moles. Unless I slipped a decimal place. And then over here, 7.5 times 10 to the minus three. Can I get a confirmation on those numbers that look right? Cool, thank you. So how do we know what runs out first? Hopefully you're starting to get comfortable enough with these, even at a two to one ratio, you might be able to look at this and guess which one's gonna run out first. The trick though is remember, it's not they're not being used at the same rate. We have less barium nitrate, but we're also using it slower. We're using the potassium chloride twice as fast, but we don't have twice as much. All right, so that's a pretty good red flag that this one is gonna run out first, even though we have more moles of it, right? So, but to show your work for that, to make sure you didn't mess something up doing mental arithmetic, we don't really care about excess reactant in this case, so we're just gonna say, use both of them to predict a, a theoretical yield for the product. So 7.5 times 10 to minus three moles KCL, 
for every two moles KCL. It's one mole barium chloride. So 3.8 times 10 to the minus three moles of product. And the other option, 4.5 times 10 to the minus three moles of barium nitrate. And that's a one to one ratio. One mole barium nitrate, one mole product. Everybody can do that math in their head. So what's our actual theoretical yield? The smaller number. How do we feel about percent yield? Should we work this all the way through the percent yield part of the question? Or should I leave that as an exercise that you can do over the weekend in all your spare time when you're thinking about extra chemistry you wanna do over the weekend? Okay. Not too tricky, right? What's, what is the general formula for percent yield? That's the main thing I want you to be remembering for percent anything. Percent of anything is always what? So for percent yield specifically, we do actual over theoretical times 100. What's the generic form if I said, what's the percent of, you know, what percent are we done with the quarter or with the semester? Part over whole times 100, right? So the thing you're asking about divided by the total times 100. Let's talk about something new then. Um, this is also just recap. I said, let's talk about something new and then I showed you a review slide. Um, these terms familiar, they showed up in the lab procedure or in the, the quote lab questions, the molecular reaction, the total ionic reaction, the net ionic reaction. Everybody familiar with those terms? What's the difference between the net ionic and the total ionic. Net ionic only has the things that change. And total ionic has things that don't change, has the spectator ions. Um, and that, if that term's not familiar, did we talk about spectator ions? Okay. Like I guess in my 103 class is covering stuff that's just barely different enough that I'm sometimes not sure if I talked to them or you about stuff like that. Um, so basically the only difference is we leave off spectator ions. Potassiums don't do anything. They're still present as potassium ions floating around in the products. So if they're present both as a reactant and a product and there was no change, you can just cancel them out. Just like an algebra equation. I had 3x plus 3 equals 3x plus 3. If I subtract, if I have 3 on both sides, you subtract from both sides, right? A balanced chemical reaction works the same way as an algebra expression, where anything that shows up on both sides can just be canceled out. All right, something more interesting then. Let's talk about acids. We talked about these three definitions, right? Briefly, maybe? No, okay, thank you. Um, I really need to rearrange the structure of 103 so that it's not covering similar material at the same time because that's really what's throwing me off. Um, so an acid in general has a couple different definitions that all 
sometimes they all apply at the same time. Um, sometimes though, we're gonna use definition of an acid that in preferentially over another definition for specific reactions. Um, but the most basic definition was, um, was first put forward by a guy named Sponte Arrhenius, um, who was the, who's incidentally, it's a part of his other research. Um, he actually did, he did enough research that he could have won the Nobel Prize about three different times if he'd lived long enough um, for various areas. Um, he defined what an acid is as basically it's something that when you put it in water, your concentration of H3O plus goes up. Of course, they didn't really understand what hydronium was in the 1800s. So they just said um, protons, H pluses. They had a way to measure that. They didn't realize that you don't if you have water and an H plus, it don't, you don't really have them as two separate things. The H plus basically gloms on to one of the lone pairs on the oxygen. And so when you have H pluses dissolved in water, no, you don't, you really have H3O plus. So we use hydronium instead, but it's the same basic definition. An Arrhenius acid is just something that when you put it in water, you get more H pluses than you started with. Um, that is that is the definition I believe that he did win a Nobel Prize for. The one he probably should have won a Nobel Prize for is he actually was the first person uh, to predict that anthropogenic climate change was occurring in the 1880s. He published research showing that rising um, CO2 concentration, he basically crunched all the numbers and said, hey, this, this whole industrial revolution thing is putting so much CO2 out from burning all this coal that we are actually going to have a noticeable difference in the in the temperature of the planet as a result. Um, and his action for his general calculations, his predictions, still pretty close. We've made some refinements to them, but back in the 1880s, um, they actually understood that climate change was a thing and was going to be a problem. Him being I blame it partly on him being Swedish. Um, he actually thought it was going to be a positive thing for humanity because things would be warm. Winters in Sweden wouldn't be quite so nasty anymore. Um, there'd be more farmable land year round. Um, but what he didn't take into account was all the extreme weather that it would cause as well. He was lo looking at it too broadly, not looking um, at some of the specific other events that would happen as well. And so why did it take until the until 2000 for for the general public to understand that? Well, because it was, you know, sort of a well, it's not really going to affect things in my lifetime sort of situation. I'm making pretty good money now, so let's worry about climate change in 40 years. Um, the probably the depressing part of Dante Arrhenius figured that out closer to the in beginning of the Industrial Revolution than today. More time has passed since he published that research than passed from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to his lifetime. Um, so that's kind of disheartening a little bit, but um, anyway, moving on to things that are more uplifting. Another definition of an acid. More, that's more uplifting, right? Um, a Bronsted Lowry acid is basically starting to look at acids not from the perspective of a solution, but looking at it from the perspective of a molecule. So Bronsted Lowry acid is just anything that can give up an H plus. Um, and a lot of times we use the term a proton donor because what is a, a hydrogen ion? What does a hydrogen atom have with subatomic particles? It's got one proton and one electron, right? If you take away that one electron, what's left? Just the proton. So we're not, when we say a proton donor, we don't mean we're actually changing a nucleus of anything. We basically just mean we've got a, a one, one proton floating around by itself, sticking on to um, lone pairs and, and sort of glomming on to other molecules. Um, so Bronsted-Lowry acid is anything that can give up an H plus and give up a proton. 
Um, however, there are, the reason we have this third definition, the Lewis acid, and that's Lewis, that's the same Lewis as the Lewis dot structure, same scientist. Um, but Lewis acid is basically, there are some, there are some things you can dissolve in water that increase the concentration of H plus that don't have any protons themselves, which seems weird. Um, but certain metals, aluminum, for instance, if you put aluminum in water, basically, it, like we talked about before, it winds up surrounding itself with all these water molecules, like we talked about when we talked about precipitation reactions, right? Well, if it holds on to these tightly enough, then it actually weakens one of these bonds so that basically these electrons can can um, jump back to the oxygen and you can kick a height an H plus off of a water molecule. And you wind up with a hydroxide stuck to your metal ion and a free floating H plus, which won't stay free floating like we just talked about. Um, but basically it means that you get extra H pluses floating around despite the fact all we did was add aluminum ions that don't have any H pluses themselves. So for this class, I'm not really gonna look, I'm not really gonna ask about Lewis acids that much. I want you to be aware of that definition and what it, and why it happens. But in general, Bronsted-Lowry definition is going to be our go-to. We're used to thinking about things at the molecular level, and that's the most common type of acid, something that has an H plus that it can give away. And when it does that, that makes it an acid. If it happens to give that away to a water molecule, you get more H3O plus. If it gives it away to something else, you have a different acid base reaction happening. Um, so this is just an example of how, it, uh, how hydrogen chloride is a gas. When, once you dissolve it in water, it splits up into H pluses and chlorides. So this is HCl acting as an Arrhenius acid, as well as a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Do you have a case where it won't be an Arrhenius acid and it will be a Bronsted-Lowry acid? If there's no water around, if you had if you had these reactions not occurring in a solution, then then the Arrhenius definition doesn't really make any sense to use. So gas phase reactions or things that are happening in non, in, in OCHEM, what we call an aprotic solvent, um, aren't necessarily going to increase the concentration of H pluses because there's not, there might not be anything around to accept them, but you could still have an acid-base reaction happening. Um, but in general, I think just not in solution. If you're not in solution, it's gonna be the most common case. So, We've talked about acids, but, and we also have these acids, we call it an acid base reaction, right? So just like with redox reactions, if there's an oxidation happening, there also has to be a reduction. If there's an acid reaction happening, if something is giving away an H plus, there has to be something there to accept it as well. And that's what we call a base. And somebody asked about, can we get a better definition of what a base is? Um, on the quiz question, well, here you go. Just like with acids, there's three definitions. There's an Arrhenius base, a Bronsted-Lowry base, and a Lewis base. And two and three are basically the exact opposite of, of what they were for acid. A Bronsted-Lowry acid is a proton donor, something that can give away an H+. A Bronsted-Lowry base is whatever is taking the H+. So if we put... HCl in water and it reacts and we make H3O plus and chloride. Well, HCl is what lost its proton, right? Lost in a hydrogen ion. It went from HCl to just chloride by itself. So that means it's acting as the acid. Whatever is accepting 
the H plus. So water starts as H2O and then it turns into H3O plus. It gained an H plus. So if it is, if it's what accepted the H plus, then that makes it the Bronsted Lowry base. Makes sense, right? We call it an acid base reaction because you need both parts, just like a redox reaction needs both re reduction and oxidation. What if the reaction happened backwards? Turns out reactions don't just happen in one direction. They can happen in the reverse direction as well. We ignored this. If we had H3O plus and chloride and it reacted to make water in HCl, what's the acid and what's the base? Hydronium is the, the acid. It's what's good if it goes backwards. H3O plus is the acid, which would make fluoride the base. We actually have a term for that. We don't want to mix up the fact that one of the reactions happening forward versus backwards, but sometimes we want to talk about pairs, like how HCl turned into fluoride. And so we, we call that the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. And there's a couple ways you can think about conjugate acids and conjugate bases, but the, the easiest, the simplest way to think about it is if the reaction happened backwards, what's the acid? If the reaction happened backward, what's the base? And the other term you might hear is a conjugate acid-based pair. And that's because HCl, when it acts as an acid, always turns into the same conjugate base. In water, when it acts as a base, always turns into the same conjugate acid. So a lot of times you hear them referred to as a conjugate acid-base pair. And it just means that you that one of them, if your acid is the product, is the reactant, the conjugate, it always has the same conjugate base. If I ask you to label all of these, this is the, the most common way I test on the on this these concepts is here's an acid base reaction label the acid the base and the conjugate acid and the conjugate base and so you start by just looking okay the reaction's happening left to right what's giving up an h plus what's get, accepting the h plus and then you say now what's if i go backwards what's happening the definition of a base that's a little bit trickier that we'll get into in, in a little bit is this idea that an Arrhenius base, based on, on definitions two and three, we might think an Arrhenius base is something that decreases your hydronium concentration. An acid increased your hydronium concentration. So an Arrhenius base should decrease your hydronium concentration. And that's accurate, but it's not the way it's usually written. It turns out that hydroxide concentration is actually a better way of tracking whether something is ba a base or not. Um, because hydronium concentration and hydroxide concentration in water are always tied together. They're inversely proportional to each other. So if your concentration of hydroxide goes up, that also means your concentration of hydronium is going down. In general though, once again, the Bronsted-Lowry definition is gonna be our go-to. If you remember nothing else from these two pages or these two slides, remember the Bronsted-Lowry definitions. The other stuff will come up though, so don't forget it all. But if I was picking one thing for you to remember, that's what it would be. Let's do some, some um, recap of nomenclature. How do we name these acids? What are our general rules for naming acids? 
if it ends in an eight, it turns into what? Ick. And then tack that word acid on the end. Ite turns into O-U-S, us. What's our last suffix? Ide, which turns into hydrochloric or hydro whatever, hydro blank it acid. So as long as you know your polyatomics, which everybody still remembers perfectly from that quiz back before break, right? Of course. I appreciate the confidence, the enthusiasm. ClO4 with the minus one charge is what? Perchlorate, good. So that makes it, it's an eight. So we're gonna do this one. So it's perchloric acid. Bromide turns to what? Hydrobromic acid. How about H2SO4? That's sulfate, which means it's sulfuric acid. All right, sulfuric and phosphoric are the ones that are slightly irregulars. You throw that extra syllable back in there. It's not phosphic acid, it's phosphoric acid, even though it's phosphate. It's, I don't know why. I wish I could just a why, but it's, it's like trying to explain why certain verbs are conjugated irregularly in Spanish or English, just the way the language is. So let's try one of the writing out an acid base reaction. We have, if, there's a reaction for carbonic acid reacting with sodium hydroxide. What are the products going to be? Well, we can start by writing out the reactant side, right? That might make it more clear what's gonna happen. So what's the formula for carbonic acid? H2CO3. And sodium hydroxide. NaOH. Now, if I just give you this without giving you any clues that it's an acid base reaction, it's still, it might be kind of hard for you to predict what's going to happen. But the fact that we're starting with an acid and we have a hydroxide. Hydroxide was part of our definition of a base, right? So if we've got something, an acid that has extra H pluses, not extra, it has H pluses, and then we have hydroxide that we know is defined as a base, what do we think is gonna happen here? H3O plus, what happens if you take a hydroxide and we stick an extra H plus onto it? Just get water. The charges are gonna cancel out. You've got a plus one and a minus one. So the charges are gonna add up to zero and the formula is just H2O, right? So if you put an acid with a hydroxide, you make water, you get hydroxide acts as the base, and it accepts that extra H plus. And then we just look at what's left over. So that carbonic acid gave up an H plus. If it gave up an H plus, what's left? Somebody said it earlier. If carbonic acid loses an H plus, what do we get? Carbonate, 
if it gave up two H pluses, it would be carbonate. What about if it just gives up one, you just get hydrogen carbonate, right? We take away one H plus from this, we get HCO3 with a minus. We took one of the protons away, not both of them. The thing about these acid-base reactions is they pretty much always happen in, in, in steps. Very rarely do we actually see both of these H pluses taken off at the same time. So we, don't, we won't usually go all the way from carbonic acid to carbonate. We make a stopover at this intermediate, which is why those polyatomic ions that had a charge that wasn't negative one, like sulfate, like carbonate, like phosphate, also had those other polyatomic ions, right? There was hydrogen phosphate and dihydrogen phosphate. There was hydrogen carbonate. There was hydrogen sulfate. Because you don't usually go straight from the acid all the way to the zero protons form. Then what else do we have as a product? We still have sodium floating around, right? So if we were writing this out in its molecular form, we would write it as sodium hydrogen carbonate. The other nice thing about these acid-base reactions, one, they like I said, they usually happen one step at a time. The other thing that's kind of nice about them is if they're happening one proton at a time, it's really, really easy to balance. If you're talking about an acid-base reaction where all you're doing is moving on from one place to another, you're almost always going to be dealing with stoichiometries that are all one to one to one to one. Right? If we if we did this again, if we took sodium hydrogen carbonate and added base to it, added another sodium hydroxide to it, then we would get carbonate, right? But the fact that it's happening in steps means that basically don't try to get fancy with the balancing. All you're doing is moving one proton at a time. So the way it's written, on this side, we kind of already defined what the acid and what the base are, right? Here's our acid, here's our base. What's the conjugate acid and the conjugate base? What's the conjugate acid first? The reaction happened backward. We'd be making carbonic acid, right? we'd need to give hydrogen carbonate an extra H plus. Where would that be coming from? From the water. So that makes water the conjugate acid or conjugate base? Conjugate acid. If we're trying to turn hydrogen carbonate into carbonic acid, we need it to accept an H plus, which makes it the conjugate base. All right, if I gave you another one of those, do you think you could identify everything? Could you, could you complete the reaction and identify everything? Should we try it? How about, how about nitric acid and hydrogen sulfate? and sodium hydrogen sulfate. First off, 
what's going to be the acid and what's going to be the base? We name it as an acid, so there's a pretty good hint that this is going to be the acid, right? The other pretty good hint is, have you ever seen something that looks like nitric acid with an extra H plus? We ever seen anything that looked like H2NO3 positive? That just feels wrong, right? That doesn't look like anything like anything we've talked about. That's a pretty good hint that we're not going to see that. Now I'm thinking about whether that's theoretically possible or not. I'll have to return to that another time because I don't actually know. Um, so if nitric acid is going to be the acid, what is it going to turn into? When nitric acid gives up an H+, plus, what is it going to turn into? Nitrate. Where does that H plus go? To the base. Good. What's the base? Yeah, sodium, hydrogen, sulfur, the other molecule, right? If this is going to be our acid, it's got to go to a different molecule. What part of the molecule? Is it going to go to the sodium ion? Is an H plus going to be attracted to an A plus? Positives are going to repel each other, right? So what is it attracted to? The hydrogen sulfate. And what is it going to produce? We're going to take our hydrogen sulfate and tack an extra H plus onto it which makes it sulfuric acid. And then what else do we have floating around? Still have those sodiums floating around, right? So most specifically, the hydrogen sulfate is gonna be the base. We've it's not really the sodium that's acting as the base. Scott? Is it possible that that's an acid-base reaction? Yes. Good question. If we make, if we happen to make something that's no longer soluble in water, then you can wind up with this. It's, it's really two reactions happening that are coupled together. Um, take Gen Chem and we'd have a whole chapter on coupled equilibria and how we can actually predict what, what the equilibrium concentrations of both of those are going to be. What's our conjugate acid and conjugate base? Sulfuric acid is the conjugate acid. nitrates the conjugate base. And again, we could have we could have labeled that right off the bat. As soon as we said nitric acid is acting as an acid and we said it's going to make nitrate that is the conjugate base because it's what's left over after the acid has acted like an acid. And if it goes backwards, the nitrate's going to have to accept an H+. Plus. So the conjugate base is always tied to the acid. The conjugate acid is always tied to the base. All right. Let's talk about pH. Most of you have had enough science classes at this point that if I say ask acid, most of you, probably the first thing that comes to mind is pH, right? Does anybody remember how or what uh, what makes what pHs constitute an acidic solution? Low pHs or high pHs? Low pHs. 
low. So basically a pH is just is just a way to quantify all we're doing is we're taking hydronium concentration and we're just going to turn it into a log scale because the hydronium concentration in water can fluctuate over huge ranges. So with with a lot of units where we have to cover a, a really broad range of values, we use log scales like the Richter scale. Does anybody, can anybody think of another log scale that's used for units? Richter scale is for, is for earthquakes, right? So a, a 5.0 is 10 times stronger than a 4.0. And a 6.0 is 10 times stronger than a 5.0. Can anybody think of another log scale that's used in units? Might not be one from a science class. Might be one you've just heard in everyday life. No? Decibels, sound, um, because we need to, we needed a sound unit to measure sound intensity that covered a really broad range of possible sounds. The human ear can hear a really wide range from really, really quiet to really, really loud. Um, the decibel scale is also, it's like the bell part of decibels is a log-based scale as well. Um, and really all we're doing to find the pH is if we know what the H3O plus concentration is in moles per liter, you just take the negative log, take the log of it, and then flip the sign, specifically log base 10. Right, so if we know something has a concentration of hydronium of... 0 0.015 moles per liter. How would we find the pH? Or what would the pH be? So you find the log button on your calculator. This is the part where everybody is going to need to remember how to use the log buttons. We haven't done much with logs in this class yet, right? And we will continue to not do much with logs in this class other than the pH scale. So this is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. So it should be something, we can take the, neck, the log of that, should get something between, between one and two, negative one and negative two. What do we get when you plug it in? You're not going to make me get my calculator out, are you? I can't do logs on my head. I can get close. Who's got a number that's between? Go ahead. So when you plugged in log of 0 0.015, you get negative 1.82. And then, but because people don't like negative numbers, the pH scale just throws this negative in front. So usually your pH is going to be a positive number. You can have a negative pH. Um, a note about sig figs. Exponents and logs have their own sig fig rules, just like addition and subtraction have different rules than multiplication and division. Um, I'm not going to make you learn a, set, a third set of sig fig rules. If you go into a field where this is important, they'll teach you how they want you to, to, to do the rounding. Basically, for this class, for pH, you're always going to go to the hundredths place. The hundredths place is actually two sig figs if you're in a log based unit. And so, and we're going to always just assume two sig figs is a decent, is a decent number of sig figs for a concentration. Um, so we're just always going to go to the hundredths place. Don't worry about it beyond that. 
So why if if a if increasing concentration of hydronium makes something an acid and increasing concentration of hydroxide makes it a base, why is it that we can have a neutral pH of seven? Why is pH of seven neutral? Let's try undoing pH. If the pH of if you have a pH of seven, what's the concentration of hydronium? I just erased this, but I'll rewrite it. pH is negative log base 10 of hydronium concentration, right? If pH is equal to 7.00 to go to the hundredths place. How do we solve for the concentration of hydronium? Sorry, I'm making you do algebra with laws of blocks. I realize that that's a low blow. But I know some of you know it. Say it again. Not quite. What do logs solve for? Why do we, logs exist? They solve for an exponent, right? So first thing we can do is we can move this negative sign over and then we just have log base 10 of our variable. This is what we're trying to solve for equals negative seven. If taking the log of this gives you seven, we were solving for an exponent, right? That cancels the log out. Raise 10 to the power of both sides, cancels out the log. So our hydronium concentration is 10 to the minus seven moles per liter. Well, that's weird. Pure water is supposed to have a pH of seven, but has a measurable amount of hydronium in it. That seems odd. What was our, what was the Arrhenius definition of a base? Something that increased the concentration of what? Hydroxide. What do you get if you have water go through an acid base reaction with water? We say, okay, water is going to act as an acid, and the base is going to be water. We transfer an H plus, right, from one water molecule to another water molecule. What do we get as the products in that case? Hydronium and hydroxide. So this means that water, when it's pure, actually has hydronium and hydroxide present. What makes pH of seven neutral is the fact that you have the same amount of both of these. It also looks a little bit weird because, well, then if this is gonna happen, if we're just using stoichiometry, what's our limiting reactant going to be? Water. So in theory, this reaction should just happen until there's no water, but it actually stops at 10 to the minus seven for our concentration of our products, right? That forward and backward idea. This reaction is what's called an equilibrium reaction, which, and I know I, I've used the term dynamic equilibrium before, right? What does a dynamic equilibrium mean? Yes, but every reaction is that. It's at dynamic equilibrium. It, the, the analogy I used was if you get paid $1,000 a month from your job, but you also spend $1,000 a month, what does your bank account look like? Zero change, right? Is it actually zero change? No, it's constantly 
have it might constantly be having things added or taken out, but the net change is zero. So basically this reaction happens constantly in water, but the forward reaction and the backward reaction are happening at the same rate. So normally we would just say, okay, well, I have a limiting reactant. I can predict this much product, get a theoretical yield, boom, done, right? Turns out that's not how reactions actually happen in the real world. Reactions don't ever go to completion. You never actually see your theoretical yield be exactly 100%. Because at some point, you get to the point where the reverse reaction is happening at the same rate as the forward reaction. What, and this is what that looks like in water. If you have water acting as, um, as an acid and a base together, they call this the auto ionization. of water. What does auto mean? Automatic. <laughs> Basically means it does it on its own. Right? And so this is always happening, but we can, it stops when you get to a pretty small concentration of H3O plus and hydronium. Sorry, H3O plus and hydroxide. And the way we quantify that is with a constant that we call an equilibrium constant, which for water, we use this subscript W. And what this means, and this, this has a number at room temperature, it's really close to 10 to the negative 14. That constant is equal to the concentration of hydronium in water times the concentration of hydroxide in water. So this is why we said that hydroxide concentration and hydronium concentration were inversely proportional because regardless of whether your solution is acidic or basic, these two concentrations have to multiply together to give you 10 to the minus 14. Well, how does that really affect us? It basically means that our pH scale is based on these two concentrations. And if you have either of these, we can actually predict the, or we can calculate the pH. So that's why Arrhenius's definition just had, it said increases concentration of hydroxide. It's because if you know the concentration, if this goes up, this goes down and vice versa. What do we get if we take the negative log of both sides of this equation? This is a balanced algebra equation. If we take the negative log of both sides, what, what do we get for the left-hand side? 14. And then on the right-hand side, we'll get All right, who's who's uh, taken their laws of logs recently? Who's had their their algebra class where you talked about logs? What can we do if we have multiplication happening inside of a log? We can do what? No, we can turn it into an addition. It's already condensed, but we can uncondense it, right? And say that. 14 is equal to negative log of hydronium plus negative log of hydroxide. Why would I leave this as negative log and, and a plus? Because what is negative log? Negative log of hydronium is what? pH. So it turns out this lowercase p, it's always a lowercase p. This is 
what's called a mathematical operator, which is just another way of saying it's a function. Anytime you see lowercase p in that variable, it means you're taking the negative log of that variable. So what's what do you suppose we call the negative log of hydroxide concentration? BOH. Good guess. What this means is that if we know either of these concentrations, all we have to do is take the negative log of it, and that will either give us pH or pOH. If we know pOH, we can get pH. If we know pH, we can get pOH, because this is a really nice, simple equation here, right? Well, why do we bother doing that instead of just doing it all with, with algebra? Who knows why we decided to involve logs when we didn't really need to in this case, other than the fact that most people think better in units from zero to 14 than they do in terms of scientific notation, right? But in theory, we don't really need pH as a unit. We could just have, say, pH, anything with a hydronium concentration that's greater than 10 to the minus seven moles per liter is acidic. But that's kind of hard to communicate to the average person who's never taken a chemistry class before, right? The average person can hear pH of less than seven is acidic and they can comprehend what that means. Um, you don't want to have to stop to explain what scientific notation is if you're trying to communicate something to, to the average person on the street. So for whatever reason, we do have these pH and pOH units. And they involve logs, which makes things tricky. And just, just like with the Richter scale, Richter scale, I already said a 5.0 is 10 times stronger than a 4.0, right? The log scale in pH means that a difference of one is a factor of 10 difference as far as how acidic it is in terms of the concentrations. So, and that's something that the average, even though the average person can, can get the hang of pH less than seven is acidic, the idea that pH of five is 10 times more acidic than a pH of six is still hard for people to wrap their head around, right? Log scales aren't intuitive that way. It takes practice. So what we're getting to here is why we spent so much time with excess reactant problems earlier. They didn't seem like that was necessarily all that useful of a, pro of a reaction type. Theoretical yields and percent yields, those all seem like pretty pretty easy to figure out why those might be important. Those excess reactant questions, like was it number number eight on the test, um, wind up making a big difference in acid-base reactions. Because if we have an acid-base reaction that's a hydroxide reacting with an acid, Whatever's left over is going to determine if our solution is acidic or basic. So here's the final, the final form of these equations for now. Is, well, if we know it's an acid-base reaction, we can write the products. We know what the, if we know the amounts that we have to start with, we can figure out how much excess reactant is left. And if we can figure out how much excess reactant is left, we can calculate the pH when the reaction is done. So let's give that a try. Let's start by writing out the reaction. No, we only have five minutes left, but we can at least start on this one. What are, what are our products going to be? Water. We got an acid and hydroxide. That always adds up to water. And then what's left besides the water? <laughs> 
still have the lithium and we still have nitrate. So how do we figure out our limiting reactant? Just like we did this at the beginning, right? Figure out what's gonna run out first. Figure out how much of your excess reactant is left and what the concentration is. Remember that those square brackets in our definition of pH and pOH mean moles per liter. All right, it's Friday afternoon. Everybody seems shot. Should we make this the quiz this weekend? Could we do that? Or is that ask, or is that gonna be going out on your own a little bit too much? I'm getting a mixed a set of mixed reactions. All right, here's what we'll do instead. We'll work our way through this on Monday. I didn't finish grading this week's last week's quiz yet. So I feel bad after asking you to take another quiz. So we'll say we're not gonna have a quiz this weekend. Instead, do your best to solve this problem. Okay, come in on Monday with it ready, ready to look at it. And we'll work our way through this on Monday, okay? Yes, I'm blaming you. I'm not checking emails. Yeah. Oh. 